right, got that nice music soothing us into Bible study. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Bible study. Ooh-wee. Um, my name is Mikey Terrell, and we're going to be studying God's Word on tonight. So excited to be studying with you. Um, we're going to be in 2 Samuel. We're going to finish our series on David, a man after God's own heart. We're going to learn how David's heart was and what it means to be a person after God's own heart and how we can be men and women after God's heart. And we're excited about that. We've been enjoying this series for a while. So we're going to get into that. But before we do that, we'd like to pray. Um, I'm going to ask Brother George if he can come and lead us in prayer. And we will go into our Bible study questions after that. And then we'll go into our lesson. Good evening. Everyone can stand. Please stand. And those online, you can close your eyes with us and give glory to God. Father, we are thankful tonight, God, just to come into your presence one more time, God, and tell you thank you, Lord, not only for this week, but this day, God. You are worthy to be praised, God. Father, we just ask you to open up our hearts tonight to receive from you, God. May your word be hid in our heart that be sitting out against you, O oh God. And Father, we want to be filled with knowledge, wisdom, and understanding, O oh God. Lord, speak through the pastor tonight. Strengthen him tonight, God. O oh God, that we may behold wonderful things out of your word tonight, God. Have your way with us, O oh God. And those that are on the way, those that are online, we ask you to touch hearts this night, God. We not only want to be conformed to this world, but we want to be transformed by the newness of our mind, God, that we might prove what's good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. We ask these things in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Somebody give the Lord. All right, you may be seated. So we always like to start off our Bible study with Bible study questions. These are questions that you can ask about life and how it relates to the Bible or about the Bible questions that you would like more clarity on. And we use that as a time to discuss those questions that aren't part of our normal curriculum. And so you can post those questions to me. You can text them to me, write them down on a piece of paper or email me uh, to the thing on the screen, the number or the email or write on a piece of paper and hand it to me. And Today, we do not have any Bible study questions that have been posed. We don't have any to, I guess everybody um, has just missed out. But if you have a question, take some time to post it. You can also post it on SJC Friends, and we'll see it there. But questions about the Bible, um, things that you may be reading, and you say, hey, what does that mean? Or why did God say that? Or, hey, i just like to discuss this as a group. If you have things you'd like to discuss, Please post those so that we can discuss them, because today we don't have anything. But that's okay. We're going to start and turn to 2 Samuel chapter 9, as we talked about on Sunday. We're going to go farther in depth into that and end our series. Second Samuel chapter nine. We read out the English Standard Version. If you're online, make sure that you uh, are commenting and letting us know that you're watching. I can see the comments on the screen as they come, um, so I'll be able to interact with you. Make, sh make sure you feel like you are interacting with us as you study along. And if you're watching this later on, please, in the comments, we can read those comments later on and interact with you. I'll read just the first couple of verses from 2 Samuel chapter 9, and we will continue on. 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 9 says... And David said, Is there still anyone left of the house of Saul 
that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake. Now there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba, and they called to him, him to David, and the king said to him, Are you Ziba? He said, I am the servant. And he we skip the part about Ziba and go to verse 4. Oh, sorry, verse 3. And the king said, Is there still not someone of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God to? Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan. He is crippled in his feet. Verse 4. The king said to him, Where is he? And Ziba said to the king, He is in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, at Lodabar. So they sent for him at Lodabar. Verse 6. And Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, son of Saul, came to David, fell on his face, and paid homage. David said, Mephibosheth, and he answered, Behold, I am your servant. And David said to him, Do not fear, for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan, and I will restore to you all the land of Saul, your father, and you shall eat at my table always. And he paid homage and said, What is your servant that you should show regard for such a dead dog as I? Then skip down to verse 13. Verse 13 says, so Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem, for he always ate at the king's table. Now he was lame in both of his feet. We talked about this on Sunday, and I want to go back over it. Our title was Emulating God. Emulating God. Emulate means, from the definition, to match or sometimes surpass, typically by imitation. We understand that as Christians, little Christ, where that word comes from, little Christ, we are to imitate God. We are to imitate him, to be like him. And as we study this heart after God, we've learned that a heart after God is a heart that seeks the knowledge of God to enjoy him and to emulate him. David has gone through his life from shepherd to king, from the pasture to the palace, and we have seen him chase after God to learn more about God. We see it in his Psalms. We see David writing over and over in his Psalms how much he loves God, how he's chasing after God, for how he delights in God's word. Psalm 119, one of the longest chapters in the Bible, says, For I delight in your commands because I love them. David said, I lift up my hands to your commands, which I love, and I meditate on your decrees. Do you love God's word? I love it. I love that I have the words of the creator of this universe who put everything together. I like, this may sound a little nerdish of me, but I enjoy reading user manuals. That sounds a little nerdish. I know. What I do is I put them in the bathroom. When I get something new, I get the user manual and I put it sometimes under the sink in the bathroom so that when I'm in the bathroom taking my time with the Lord on the the throne of grace, I can read that user manual and learn everything it is about that thing that I bought. I don't want there to be a feature that I don't know about. I get so mad whenever I see somebody doing something with something that I have and I did not know. I want to know everything about it so I can enjoy it. This is the heart when you love God and you understand how wonderful he is. You want to know everything that you can know about him so that you can enjoy it. That's why I love the word of God because it gives us so much about God's heart. Is it everything? No. None of the books of the world could contain all the knowledge of God, but it gives us quite a bit. It always surprises me when people say, I can't believe you're basing all that you believe and all that you do off of one book. And I go, well, here's the thing. You read that book from front to back, understand it all, and then after you do that, then you go looking for other books. Because the Bible alone, you, you will read it over and over and get more and more and more. And I love that Jesus would say, all of it points to me. When he's talking to his his haters, the people who were going against him, they said, well, we believe in Moses. He said, no, if you believed in Moses, 
You would believe in me because the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, Moses was writing about me. He says all of the things pointed to me. All of the things, if you loved his writings and loved what they were about, then when you saw me, you would see that I am the fulfillment of all those things. When you love God's word, you, you, you read it so that you can know more about it. And Jesus says, I am the fulfillment of his word. So it makes you say, I want to know Jesus more. I want to understand how he worked. This person who is God incarnate but came in the flesh and who is still in the flesh, by the way, which is amazing and, and complicated to think about. Jesus is still in the flesh. He didn't change when he got on that cloud. And when he comes back, we will be able to see him because he will be in the flesh. How does he work? The man who sits at the right hand of God when I'm praying and making intercessions for all the prayers, how does he work? I want to understand how he answers my prayers. I want to understand what he does in my heart. I want to understand how he lived this life and lived it perfectly without sinning. I want to understand what he did whenever he was tired, but he still ministered. I want to understand how after he had a whole day of ministry, he would still go off and go up into the mountains and talk to his father all night. Because if he could enjoy his father after that, I want to get that same kind of enjoyment. I believe we're here on this earth to minister to God's people, to fulfill our purposes, but ultimately to enjoy. To enjoy it. There's some things, there's other things in life that we do that we don't enjoy. Absolutely. Some things that are tough. But there are some things that when we're doing them and our God-given purposes that we should be able to enjoy. David says, I love enjoying your commands. I love doing what you say to do. Anybody love doing what God says to do? I love it. Is it easy? No. But I love just trying to do it. I love just trying to live the right life. This is a heart that chases after God to enjoy him. David would also say, you guide me with your counsel. And afterward, you will take me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. When you really get to know God and understand God, you realize that there is nothing in comparison to him. You might need to remind yourself every day as you see commercials and as temptations come about that there is nothing better than God. But you will constantly arrive at this conclusion that there is nothing compared to him. When you get to know him through Jesus Christ, you get to enjoy this life. David says, on earth there is nothing I desire besides you. He says, my heart and my flesh may fail. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. I love how God, as he reveals his word to his people, would say, I'm going to bless you with all of these things, but your main blessing that you're going to receive is me. This is, a, this is the goal of Bible study, by the way. It's not just to know more about the Bible or not even just to know more about God. It's to know God. And then to enjoy him. That's what we're doing. We're trying to fill ourselves with all the knowledge of God to be able to enjoy him. Because then we can enjoy ourselves. Because all this is is a user manual for how to use this body, this mind, and this heart in the way that the, the ma maker and the creator desire for it to be. That's true happiness, I believe. David, I believe, as he, as he lived his life, enjoyed it. One, because he enjoyed God, and then he began to emulate God, to be like God. Look at Acts chapter 13 before we start breaking down these scriptures, because this is one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible, I believe. Um, and it sums up David's life in the New Testament. Acts chapter 13, verse 36 It says, and for David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid with his fathers and saw corruption. 
He says he served the purpose of God in his own generation. Don't you want that to be said about you? That you served your purpose. That in the time that God put you in, during all that's going on now, you serve the purpose. Which is, it's confirming to me that God puts us in certain places in certain times for specific reasons. That he's made you and me just for a time as this. So that we are prepared and we are equipped for the way that the world is now. I just wish that the world was like it used to be. No, God made you for how the world was going to be, how he knew it was going to be. By the way, shameless plug for our series is coming up on the last days. We're going to see how the scriptures prophesied of how the times would be and how we are to prepare ourselves for how we are to conduct ourselves in this time based on what the scriptures said. I want that to be said about me, that I fulfilled my purpose. I love that we have a purpose to fulfill. I see many people after they retire, sitting at home doing nothing. Don't know what to do anymore. They've been thinking this whole time that they've been working in order to live. But something changed in their mind and now they've only been living to work. And so when they stop working, they don't know what to do anymore. They feel like they've, they've lost their purpose in life. And I love that how God works. He says, you've got a purpose as long as you've got breath in your body. And it's not just to work. Those people who think that life is all about work, that's all they will have. And they miss the whole scripture that God commands us to rest every seven days. They just no, I ain't got time for that, God, because I got to work so I can live. And God is saying, no, you better rest so you can live, because work will kill you. It's about enjoying what God says, and God has given us the recipe to enjoy. He's given us a purpose in life to fulfill that purpose, and he's given us commands in order how to do it. David served his purpose. Do you know what your purpose is in this generation? I believe our purpose is to share the good things that God has given us. And we're going to see how David does this in this story. By the way, if you've ever heard this story preached or taught, it mainly focuses on Mephibosheth, which is a wonderful thing to focus on. But we here would focus on David. Let's look at these scriptures real quick and, and go through these things. And I want to ask you a couple of discussion questions as we end this series. David says, I'm looking for somebody of the house of Saul that I can show the kindness of God to. As we minister to people, as we encourage others, which all of us should be doing in our Christian walk, having people who God puts in our life to encourage, to teach, to guide, to disciple, to mentor. We got to make sure that we see what place we do it out of. We've got to see where our source of energy is. We've got to see where our well of knowledge comes from. Here's what's dangerous when we do it out of what's natural. What's out of our own strengths that we can, that we can muster ourselves. Because if you'll find out late, eventually that if you're really doing ministry as God has called you to and saying yes to all that God says yes to, it will drain you if you do it out of the natural. If you do it out of your own, what you think. If you do it out of how much you like the people, <laughs> it's not enough. Because you're not going to like everybody who God puts in your path. God will specifically put people that you don't like and who probably don't like you. David here is asking, is anybody left of the house of the man who tried to kill him for years? David says, yes, but I still need to bless this house. Make sure we are doing it out of the proper source. The, Bi the Bible doesn't say it's a popular saying, though, to minister out of the overflow. As you gather all the things God has given you, 
and take inventory by gratefulness and thankfulness of all that God has given you, then you see what you can minister out of. Don't minister, don't share, don't teach, don't mentor out of something that you don't have yourself. That's why it's important to know yourself, to know your strengths, to know your purpose for your generation, so that you can minister out of that instead of trying to minister out of something that you were never called to do. Praise helps you get inventory for the things that you've given. God, thank you for giving me this. Thank you for leading me through this experience. God, thank you for putting these people in my life. God, thank you for giving me this job. God, thank you for giving me this knowledge in this specific topic. Now, God, help me to share that with others. A spiritual inventory of what you have, of what you've learned, of your experiences. Interesting that Mephibosheth is in Lodabar, which is a place of nothing, a low place, a place of abandonment. David says, although I live in a palace, I've had experiences with low places. I know what it's like. I can minister unto this person. Does anybody have low to bar experiences in the house? Online? I'm not sure. Y'all don't look like it. Y'all don't look like what y'all have been through. That's a praise God. Y'all don't y'all been in the fire, but y'all don't smell like smoke. Thank you. You caught that reference. Some of us don't want to mention those moments. We don't, we don't, I don't even want to think about, oh no, 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 don't, don't bring me back there. Don't, don't talk about that. Don't talk about that. Don't bring that up. And what God is saying is that the purpose of your generation is to use those experiences to help other people who are coming out of that. If you can't deal with it, maybe you haven't really gotten up out of it, number one. But if you have dealt with it, I want to use those experiences to connect with other people. You keep wondering, why do all these weirdos keep coming up to me? Why do all these people keep asking me these questions about this? I don't want to talk about this. God is saying, no, I, I want you. I put you through that. I allowed you to go through that. Wait, you allowed me to go through that? I thought I'd put. No, I allowed you to go through it to let other people come in. God, but I don't like people. Well, then you got a problem. God puts Mephibosheth, this crippled nobody, at the table with King David. Can y'all can y'all imagine this for a moment? Because I'm I put, putting myself there and go, man, I don't even know if I would be comfortable eating with King David. What could he see spiritually that maybe he'd see about me that maybe ask me that I'd be uncomfortable with? King David, a man who could cut your head off and then write a poem about it and sing a song about it. I don't even know what to say around this man. What if I say something that, that upsets him? What if, I, what if I say a joke? I sometimes, you know, give out jokes when I'm nervous, say a joke, and it offends him, and I get my own head cut off. He's got to be spiritual and close to God. Maybe his, you know, his meter of what's acceptable to say and not is way higher than mine. David? David had to be rough around the edges. Anybody ever had people who were veterans in, in their house or know people who were veterans? Praise God for them. Praise God if you're a veteran. But some veterans are a little shell-shocked. You've been through a couple of wars. It kind of changes you. David had been through a whole bunch of wars. And God brings this man who's been hiding, afraid for his life, to the table of a man who is one of the most famous humans in all of history. To the table together. What is God up to? God is fulfilling his purpose in David's life, but also his purpose in Mephibosheth's life. He says, Mephibosheth, I'm going to show you the kindness of God, which we also, also ought to do, is to show kindness to others, to be compassionate for others. And then number two, oh no, my computer just went black. 
Give me one second. I have my notes on my phone as well. I want to ask you a question as we bring this up. I was waiting, waiting for it. Do you think that David treated Mephibosheth special because he was a cripple? Or do you see it in the text? What do y'all think? No? Why, why would you say no? Because he what? So he treated him that way because he was Jonathan's son. Mm -hmm. So when, when David put all those servants, we see later he says, Ziba, all of your household, y'all are going to be Mephibosheth's servants. All this land I'm giving to Mephibosheth. David went above and beyond what he could have done. He could have just said, I'm not going to kill you. Okay, keep going. No, he gave him all the land and gave all of Ziba's house, which is kind of unfortunate for Ziba, all his house, sons and daughters, as servants. And y'all think it was all just based on his love for Jonathan and not because he was crippled. So I'm interested. I'm, it's fair. I thought some people would say yes to that. Because you think about Mephibosheth is crippled. He can't get around like everybody else can. Even getting to the table might be difficult. Uh -huh. Did Mephibosheth have a child? I believe so. What do you mean by get around? Y'all think Mephibosheth was getting around? Where is the Bible study going? Huh? Mephibosheth was still doing his thing. Blessed and highly favored, amen, somebody. Just because you crippled don't mean that you can't still use what God has given you. He was just crippling his feet. He just couldn't walk. So yeah, he was still getting around, but he was crippled. It, it, was, part, it was part of his life situation. And the Bible mentions it several times to make a point. Even at the end, it says, and he was still, at the very end of this chapter, he was still lame in his feet. Both of them. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. Hmm. She says David was the least expected out of his household to be king. We're making parallels here between David and Mephibosheth, which is wonderful. On Bible study to see the parallel. David, out of all his brothers, they didn't, was an afterthought. Saying, you don't, you don't, you don't have any more sons in the, or, or sons in the thing in, in your house. And he says, oh, me, uh, we, got, we got David, but you know, David, you know. Go ahead and bring him out of here. I will not sit down. I think David probably thought about that all the time. We, we often think about the moments we've been rejected in our lives. Do we not? Michael Jordan, they mention all the time that when he was in high school, they tried to, he tried to make the team and the coach did not let him. And that turned something inside of him to become the greatest basketball player. That's right, I said it. And still the greatest basketball player to have ever played the game. Yes, I said it. 
we often remember the times that we were rejected. A lot of times your strengths come from the low to bar moment. And by the way, if you're in a low to bar, if you're in a valley right now, I want to let you know that valleys are always signs that a mountain is present. Valleys, when you're in a valley, means you're in between two mountains. There are mountains on each side. Mountaintops, what we're talking about are times where things are good and you're prospering. David is at a mountaintop right now. If you see early in the chapter, he's at peace with his enemies. He's conquered all these people. He's, he's set up things and garrisons all over the place. And now from that, he's able to bless others. He's in a mountaintop experience, but he has not forgotten his valleys. He even write about it in one of the most popular psalms, Psalm 23. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. David was able to connect with people who were in valleys because he had experienced valleys quite a bit. God wants to use your valleys to help others, to connect with others, to make parallels. A lot of times we can't connect with people because we don't see anything to relate with them. No, you can. You just sometimes you only think about your mountaintops. But that's how we connect with people right now. Modern day Instagram is all about taking the mountaintop taking a picture of your mountaintop experiences. And if you're not having one, take a picture of yourself and Photoshop a mountain in the background. That's what Instagram is and Facebook, the mountaintop experience. Nobody wants to see when you're at the low moments. Nobody wants to see that. What's that? You'll lose your followers. Nobody wants to follow somebody who's in a valley. What, what, what you do is you, you go through the valley, and then after you've gone through it and you've gotten back to the mountaintop, then you share it after that. That's what they want you to do. I've been in a low, really dark place for the past six years, but now I'm great, and I want to share about this. Like, why you didn't talk during the six years? When we try to forget these moments, we can't connect with people. But when you can remember, this is how you're able to connect with people because God says he will exalt the humble. And I love in Matthew, Jesus brings this up, and, I, and you said you thought you used the word least in a bad way. Jesus actually says Matthew 5 and 37, the, that the king will say, I'm sorry, Matthew 25 and 40, the king will answer, I tell you the truth, anything you did even for the least of my people here, you've also done for me. Jesus would say, as you connect with these least, as these forsaken, as these cast off, with these, as these cripples, as these people who are low on the totem pole. He said, whenever you do anything for them, I'll put that and charge that to my account. And I don't know about you, but I love being on God's account. I love charging things to his tab. Oh, because he pays back, doesn't he? He pays back handsomely. Yes, he does. He pays with extra with interest that you ain't got to pay back. I love, but he says, it's not going to be when you're blessing people who are already blessed. That's easy, right? I'm always amazed at these rich people who hang out with other rich people, and they give each other these big old presents. Oh, I got this extra car in the garage. What would you like to take it? They wouldn't do that for a per poor person. They do that for other rich people. And have you ever noticed that? I, I don't know what it is about it, because maybe it's some kind of status thing, like, I can share this with you. Oh, I'm going to take you out to this restaurant. Oh, how much is the dinner? $200. Oh, no big deal. But you don't see them doing that with people who actually need it. They do that with people who are on their level. Jesus says, yeah, you do that because you're just kind of rubbing each other's backs because you know they'll be able to do it back for you. You won't get any extra points for that. You'll get extra points for the people who are the least of these. You'll get extra points for the people who actually need it. You'll get points for ha not hanging out with people who you, who you love to hang out with, who can give you a good word, who can give you a good conversation. He said, I'm going to give you points for the people who really need a friend. And the people who really need a friend probably don't have great social skills. Probably can't pay for lunch. May not smell very good. 
Maybe a little embarrassing you being seen with them. Because these are the people that I want you to do it with. David, though, number point number two, kept his promises. And I have never heard a sermon or even I talk, heard anybody talk about the importance of being a man or a woman of your word. Jesus would say, Matthew 5 and 37, let what you say be simply yes or no. Let your yes be yes. Oftentimes we are tempted to try to give people extra assurance that we're going to do the things that we say we're going to do. Because we are so used to people not doing what they say they're going to do. Jesus says the difference that you're going to see between those people who are my followers and the people who are not are the people who can keep their word. Any, anybody raise your hand if you've had somebody disappoint you by not doing what they say they were going to do. Raise your hand if you've been one of those people. Jesus says there's going to be a difference between my followers and those who don't follow me. My followers are going to be people when they say yes, they actually mean it. And when they give promises, they follow through with those promises. Here's the thing with promises. When you give it, it feels good. Oh, if you, I promise I'm going to, I got you. I got you. Don't worry about it. I got you. Promise. See, what happens, though, what had happened was life happens. Situations come about that you didn't see. Oh, see, I was going to be there, but then the traffic came. You know, I was going to come, but you know, Man, it was real hot outside. You know Texas heat. I was going to do it, but then I got held up on the last thing I was doing, and I, I was going to be there. But, you know, life happens, stuff that we didn't see, and we think that those situations and circumstances are some kind of way valid excuses for not upholding our promises. David made a promise to Jonathan before he was even king. Jonathan, when I am king, I will take care of your people. He didn't know that Saul was going to keep trying to kill him. He didn't know that he was going to have to go through all these valleys, trials, all this kind of craziness. He didn't know that his sons would try to take his throne two different times. He didn't know that his sons would die. He didn't know that his family would be jacked up. He would find that out later on. His son would try to take the throne from his own father. Another son would, would rape one of his uh, daughters, and then those sons would kill him. He didn't know all of that was going on. It, he might have even tempted to say, man, I was going to take care of your family, but after all that Saul did, y'all don't deserve it. Mm -mm. Second, he would have been tempted to say, hey, I ain't really got it right now. I'm trying to make sure my own family is good. We got some problems right now. I'll check y'all later. That's some of us, either one or number two. You've disqualified yourself from me keeping my own promise. But again, when you show God's kindness, when you share out of your well that comes from God, you think, who can disqualify themselves from a God promise? Nobody. Have I disqualified myself from the promises that God has given me? Mm -mm. So how am I going to do it to somebody else? We got to be people who keep their word as God keeps his word to us. God says, I'll never leave you or forsake you. He says in Romans 8 that there is nothing that can separate you from the love of Christ. And then he goes through a whole list of things. God, we cannot separate ourselves from his love. We cannot separate ourselves from the promises that he's given us. We cannot separate ourselves from him continually providing for us. Do we mess up? Yeah, and he keeps on providing for us. Do we sin? Yes, and he keeps on putting the right people in our path. Do we mess up and do stuff even against him? Yeah, but he still continues to pour out love and grace 
over and over again. We don't spend time with him. We miss going out with people, going to church. We miss giving to others, and yet he still continues over and over to be gracious to us. And this is how we ought to show love for others and keep our promises. We keep our promises not even because of the person. We keep our promises to please our Father. This challenged me this week as I thought about it. I said, man, what promises have I not kept? I know in my own life, I just share from my own, I've missed a whole lot of weddings. I'm saying this, God, things that make y'all laugh, but also hopefully it, it, it helps in the right areas. I didn't know that weddings were so expensive. I had no idea. I'm sorry. I didn't know. My mama, I'm not going to throw you under the bus today. Not today. I didn't know. I, I never really, I just, I just never put two and two together that, you know, all those chairs and all that food cost money. So when somebody would say, Mikey, you want to come to my wedding? I'd be like, oh, thank you. Yeah, I'm going to come. And when I'm saying I'm going to come, that just means like I have the hope that I'll be there, you know, if nothing better comes up. For a long time, I've, God has transformed me and saved me from that moment, I, from, I think, I hope. But I have missed a whole lot of weddings. If you're watching this and I missed your wedding, I'm sorry, but I plan on giving you a gift one day when the Lord blesses me. I missed a bunch of weddings, y'all. I didn't, I, I didn't know it was that big of a deal. I thought it was like another party. You know, you show up or you don't show up. Until I had my own. And I was like, man, they, they charge for everything. Everything. The little thing that's on the table, y'all going to charge me for that? I can put that on myself. Y'all got that from the dollar store. I saw it. No, that ain't $15. Every little thing they want to charge you for. Take a couple pictures. No, we got camera phones. It wasn't until I went through the experiences myself that I saw how important when I vowed to do something that those people were depending on me because they were paying for me to come. They were paying all of these things, and they were expecting a gift to help them with all those things. And I was like, oh, no, I'm not going. Then I started going. I didn't know I was supposed to give a gift. It's like, hey, I showed up. That should be enough right there. I changed my whole schedule just to show up. And now they want money on top of that? That's asking too much. I didn't know. I wasn't, I just didn't know. I wasn't taught. I didn't know. I was not, I did not know. I promise it was not something I was intentionally doing. I just thought, hey, I made it, which for the other five that I missed, that's a step up. I'm saying I just missed them, just didn't go. Didn't say, sorry, I missed it. It was just like, hey, they had an extra chair. I'm sure they just put somebody else in there. Did not know. It's so important that we keep the vows that we make. When we say we're going to do something, do it. We don't have to add a bunch of yet promises, add a bunch of stuff on there. When you say yes, let it mean yes. And be okay with saying no. The Bible says it is better to not say anything, to make a promise, and to not keep it. Especially if you make that vow to God. Be very careful if you make a vow to God. It's better if you don't say anything at all because he will require that thing of you. But if you say it to a friend, as a Christian, you represent God. And how you love people is how they see God must love them. God always keeps his promises, always follows through. It's better to not say anything at all, but then be good at saying no, too. Just because you're a Christian don't mean you have to say yes to everything. Be good at saying no. Anything on keeping promises? Because I, I feel like it's not talked about a whole lot. Think about the promises that you have given and see if there's some that you need to still make, make good for. Last point here, as I find it on my notes, is that David invited him to the table. Group discussion, why do we not eat at each other's houses that much anymore. What do you think? COVID. Okay. I, I, could, I would take that if we were still following all of COVID's rules. 
right? What would you call that? <laughs> we don't want to invite people to the messes in our lives. Let me get cleaned up first before I disciple somebody. Let me get my faith perfect before I try to share it with somebody else. Let me not bring somebody into my house because my house is tore up. She, I love how you say that. I live in my house. It's so true. Why else do we not sh invite people to the table to fellowship? Think about some reasons. Sometimes it's because the people who might come might be real awkward. You know? Bring them to the table. They might bring up all kinds of stuff, talk about all kinds of stuff you don't want to talk about, may not know when to go home. You've given every clue. Well, what you doing tomorrow? That should normally be the clue when it's by the end. Oh, what you getting ready to do? Well, I'm not getting ready to do it, but I'm planning on staying here tonight. They miss every cue. And now you got to figure out what's the nice, most Christian way to tell them to get up out of your house. Come on, why do we not, why do, we not do this as much? Inviting people to the table, to fellowship. What's that? Cost. Maybe we don't have enough money to feed the person. So fellowship doesn't happen at all in your life. I've noticed that very often that my, pa my own patience with people normally is the same as my level of patience in prayer with God. Sometimes I don't pray just because I'm impatient. Or it's just real quick, God, press this, I need this, help me. Amen. When fellowship does not happen in the house, it's hard to happen in other places. Remember, our vertical relationship is connected to our horizontal relationships. Fellowship ought to happen, number one, in our houses. Parents, mothers, and fathers together which is in, in African-Americans is, is only happens, what, 34% of the time now? But how it should be, mother and father together should have fellowship with their kids every day. And fellowship should be a normal thing, a daily thing of sitting down and fellowshipping, asking how you're doing, what's going on, how can I pray for you, who are your teachers, do you have friends at school, what are y'all learning today? Here's the things that I'm going through. But it's not, it's getting farther and farther away as we become more and more individualistic. I go to my own room. As our houses get bigger, we get farther and farther separate. By studies alone, families that have smaller houses are closer families. Not just in proximity, but in relationship. Because when you're close and you're in the same room, you've got to talk to that person. Look at us right now. Big old church. And we're spread out all over the place. Party culture, as a DJ, I understood that the smaller the venue, the more packed it is, the better the party was going to be. So we would intentionally, how many people do we have? Okay, no, we can't go to a big place. We got to go to a smaller place so that people can be cramped in there because it's going to force them to talk to each other, dance with each other, and it's going to make the party better. But when you don't have to, this is what I came to do right here. Get my relationship with just me and God and me. No one, nobody asks me no questions. Ask me how I'm doing. See that. Invite me. Go to eat lunch. Have a deeper relationship. Mm -mm. I'm, as soon as he says it's over, amen, hitting the door. This is what church has become. Not a community, not a spiritual community that, that builds one another up and sharpens one another. It is just an entertainment. Amen. That's why online is so... So attractive. 
Because now you can just get what you get, get yours, and you ain't got to worry about nobody else. And we see what's happening in communities and the culture now. We see killings of, in schools happening more and more. It's common now. We don't even think about it twice. Oh, another one? Oh, okay. We see families being torn apart. Oh, how many, how many families don't have fathers in the homes again? Oh, well, you know, that's normal. It's been like that for a while. Oh, how many divorces are happening? Ah, uh, well, you know, this divorce is kind of hard. Oh, what's uh, homosexuality? Oh, it's continuing. Oh, now trans, transgender. Oh, it's uh, growing more and more and more. Yeah, you know, the world is changing. We don't see that it's because the table is no longer happening. Oh, those kids are just crazy now. Where were you when they were building up and growing in that craziness? Where are we? I'm guilty of it myself, just eating alone because it's convenient, and I still got stuff to do. I got work. I don't have time to sit down and eat and enjoy. You go, what is your real principle of the understanding of what life is for? Is it to be enjoyed, or is it just to get through? Because I believe that God has called us, and I believe David believed that he was called to not only live this life, but to enjoy it. To not only serve God, but to enjoy him. Not only to live this Christian life, but to enjoy living. Not only to give to others, but to enjoy giving to others. Mephibosheth ate at David's table every single day. As I say, God help me, because I don't know about all that. It's, it's hard seeing the same person I'm married to every single day. Every day? Every day I got to see this person. Every single day. God's still working on me, Brother George. He saw Mephibosheth limp into his house every day. Why didn't God heal Mephibosheth? Wouldn't, have he, wouldn't healing have been better than him sitting at David's table? Would you rather be healed in both of your feet or sit and enjoy a free meal at King David's table. Something to think about. If you were Lazarus, would you have rather, remember the story of Lazarus, would you have rather never gotten sick and died, or been sick, died, and then resurrected by Jesus Christ? Which one would you rather have? Because Jesus thought it was better that Lazarus had died. Jesus said, I, he is more effective dead than being, being healthy. And God, for whatever reason, thought Mephibosheth was more effective being lame than being well in both of his feet. What do you all think that that means? Let me hear from you. I, hear, I see those minds working. Yeah. All right. I'm a little blind. Whoo! Come on, Brother George. What does that mean? <laughs> oh, man. Did y'all hear that? Maybe that's why I'm short, Brother George. Yeah, you're short too. Something about it is keeping us alive. Maybe give people give, give us a little extra grace. Being a little bit more approachable. Brother Gibson, you didn't say nothing. You're short too in here. But just wait, Brother George, because you, you dropped on something. Maybe God allowed him to be lame so that he wouldn't be a threat to David. Because David was a man after God's own heart, but David was a man of war. 
And he could have easily been tempted to be like, I think this dude is going to try to betray me like my own son did. When you have a wound like that, you got to have something to, to compensate for that wound. Because that person is, that, when your own son tries to take your own throne, you, you don't trust just hardly anybody. But it's easier to bless and trust somebody who's humble. God may be keeping that thing in your life and not taking that thing away to keep you humble and so that other people will be more likely to bless you because they're not threatened by you or jealous of you. Nobody wants to celebrate the person who's already perfect. They want to celebrate the person who they, who's had a life that they, that's similar to them, who went through some hard times, who had some struggles, and say, no, I can celebrate, I can elevate with this person because I can relate with them, and they're not going to think that they're better than me. They're going to be able to see me as an equal. That's why people hate people who have been second or third generation. People have this thing about, oh, no, everybody needs to bring their own self up. You were born into money. Yeah, I don't know. I don't want, uh, uh, yeah. you, but you had it easy. They want the people who have this hard struggle in their life. That's the people that they want to relate with. Because it's something that they say they can already assume humility in that. And we can do that. Others, what do y'all see that connection between why Mephibosheth never was healed and how that deals with his relationship with David? I love that. Thank you, Brother Joel. Yep. Hmm. Praise God. And how this all relates to the gospel is that we are all deformed, spiritually sick, and dead without the knowledge and the, and the acceptance of that. All this is is just life coaching, which is what you get on a lot of Instagram preaching nowadays. It's just life coaching. It's not really the gospel. It's not preaching. It's just teaching you how to live a better life. I want to let you know you can live the greatest life you want to and still go to hell. God's wrath is still against sin. And without our cleansing of the, from the blood of Jesus Christ, we can't enjoy God. We can't have a relationship with him. We can't really glow, grow closer to him. We cannot get to the table unless Jesus Christ is that door. He cleanses us of our sins so that we can be at the table and not be destroyed by God. He makes intercessions for the Father while he's sitting next to the Father and we're praying unworthy prayers. He is whispering and saying, do it for him and do it on my account. We are Mephibosheth. Jesus, God has brought us to the table because our friend, Jesus Christ, our Father, Jesus Christ, like Jonathan, who had a connection with David, Jesus has that connection with the Father. We don't deserve a seat at the table. That means, that's why, that's why anything that you get from now on, you're grateful for because you realize you didn't deserve it. It was all given to you. Then you can freely give it to others because you're not afraid of not getting more because the person who gave you more has an, has an unlimited supply. You are only stingy whenever you realize that your source of whatever that thing is is natural. But if it's supernatural, you are a giver. Oh, I don't mind giving. Oh, let me give you extra. I got more coming. I've been in valleys, and if I have to get in a valley, if me giving you this puts me in a valley, it's all right. I got valley shoes. I've been there before. Now I can get in that valley and get back up out of it. Somebody comes to my house and they say it's messy. That's all right. I can clean. But until that time, come in my house, share with the goodness of God with me. I can share with you a few things that I know about him. 
I can share a few things of how I've learned how to go through some trials and some valleys, and I can encourage you in those things. The only time you think that you don't have enough is whenever you're not looking at the right source. You have more than enough to do whatever God is calling you to do, to fulfill your purpose in your life, to give to others, to be a blessing to others, and to bring others to the table that Jesus provides and invites us to. Who are you inviting to the table? Who are you inviting to your literal tables? Can we all agree to be more prayerful about who we can be inviting to our table? Who can be eating after dinner, after church dinner with us? Who we can have a coffee with every once in a while? Maybe your house needs to be cleaned. So if you invite somebody, it will motivate you to clean that house. <laughs> Esther hasn't been here in a while. Guess what my house looks like? Oh, man. You don't even want to know. But when she comes back, guess what? Oh, you heard me get this up because you know it's going to be an issue. <laughs> Inviting people over into your life will help you get some stuff out that you need to get out. It'll clean you up on the inside, too. Those things that you're struggling with, you may not even struggle with them no more. You have so many people coming to your house, you won't have time to be depressed. I encourage you. God is calling us to be a church, a community, friends, fellowship, as David for us for Mephibosheth. That's how he's going to continue to transform the world, and that's how, he, that's how we are going to prepare this world for Jesus coming back. Can we praise God for the David series? <laughs> praise God for what we can learn about having a heart after God's own heart. Would you stand? I want to pray out with us. Get ready for our new series on the last days. The next two weeks will be free Bible studies that will just be open to the teacher. Um, but then after that, we will go into our last days series to start off uh, the month of August. Let us pray. Father, we like David say you are good. We, like David, say we love your word. We love your commandments. We love trying to do them. And God, we love your people. Don't like them all the time, but we sure love them. We thank you for the people that you put in our lives that have helped us. God, we thank you for the people who have lived examples of godly men and women that we can follow, have lived godly marriages so that we can model after them and we can talk to them and learn about God, help us to be generous. God, we're struggling. Some things we're struggling and we don't, we don't have it all together. Some bills are bigger than our income. God, but help us to be generous anyway. You are Jehovah Jireh. You provide for us all the time. We always will have more than what we need because we have you. God, let our contentment be in you. Let our joy be in you. Let what we have be in you and what we share be out of what you have given us. Give us a heart to share. Give us trust in you to share with others and not be worried about ourselves because you provide for us. Then God, help us to keep our promises. God, let us be men and women of our words. Let us resemble you and how you always keep your promises to us. Let us keep our promises to others. Let our yes be real. Let us be honest and true. And have integrity, Father, when people are watching as well as when they are not watching, with people who are great and especially with the least, Father. Help us care for those people, the cripples, the struggling, the weirdos, whatever we want to call them, God. Help us to be caring for them so that we can build your kingdom, Father, so that we can do what you say, so that we can fulfill our purpose for our generation. We give you praise because we know with that comes blessings, comes honor, comes glory for you. It comes joy, comes enjoying this life, not just going through it, but really enjoying this rich and beautiful life that you have given us. We know that comes from having a heart like yours. We pray these things and receive these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can we give God some praise tonight? You are dismissed. Bless the food in Jesus' name.